Some Bible critics find it difficult to accept that this collection of ancient writings could be so consistently accurate in how it covers the geography of where most of what it describes takes place, the area in and around modern-day Israel. Yet the Gospels are both accurate and consistent in their geographic descriptions. This presentation is one in a series from the Gospel Online, and you can subscribe below. Also click the bell icon to be notified when new presentations are uploaded. Please like if this talk is helpful, and you can ask questions using the comments below. GPS Galileo, GLONASS, Baidu, Navic. Well, you might not have heard of all of these, but you've almost certainly used at least one. These are all networks of orbiting satellites, well over 100 in total, used for pinpointing a position on Earth, uh, operated by the American, European, Russian, Chinese and Indian authorities, respectively. But there are many other satellites up there looking down and helping us to understand what's happening on the Earth's surface. There are high resolution mapping satellites that scan the Earth's surface and can identify not just land, sea, ice, vegetation or buildings, but can distinguish between crops and levels of human activity, chemical composition of the air and many other aspects. And then there are weather satellites tracking the complex behaviour of the atmosphere and its interactions with the land and the ocean. Overlaying the view from space today, we also have easy online access to comprehensive high resolution aerial photography covering most inhabited parts of the world. We have at our fingertips an incredible amount of detailed geographical information, allowing us to visualize a place or make a journey without having ever been there. And most of us probably take all of this for granted. When we tap in a destination on the car sat nav, a route just appears and we take little thought for how the data to make that possible has been collated. We just set off and follow the instructions to turn left and right. We're less familiar with where we live, the places and landmarks connected together by distinct routes. But for most of human history, that's all we've had. Villages, towns, cities with routes connecting them. Sometimes routes will be distinguished by a natural feature, such as a ford through a river or a pass through mountains. But before satellites or maps, our understanding of distance and position was understood in terms of how long it might take to walk or ride on horseback. To know a route, you would either have to ask a guide who was familiar with it, or travel it yourself. Personal knowledge and experience would be the only thing making it possible to describe geographical details with any accuracy. In the last few decades, as we've considered, access to geographical information has been transformed, but go back just a few centuries and even accurate navigation at sea was an enormous challenge. Go back two millennia and the Roman Empire was nearing its largest extent, Roman civil engineers were skillful. They surveyed and built a network of roads linking military camps and major cities right across their territory. And in the provinces of Judea, Galilee and Decapolis, where Jesus lived and travelled and uh, did most of his teaching, well, the topography and the geography is the same as today. But the writers describing events in the Gospels had no access to accurate mapping or geographic data. The historic routes that they'd been trodden for, for centuries would be the way people moved around, and so would be how they understood their local area and its wider context. The travels of Paul are described in great detail in the Book of Acts. Uh, it's packed with little details that might seem inconsequential or even been challenged as examples of inaccuracy, but have since been shown through archaeological discovery to have been true. Descriptions of cities such as Athens and Ephesus show it was written from personal experience or first-hand accounts. That Paul could travel rel relatively easily by land, as described, was due to that Roman road network, 
arguably at its best condition in the mid first century uh, and a time also that was marked by a high level of peace and security. This all points to the account being written by someone very familiar with the political geography as well as the physical geography of the Roman world. And that writer was Luke. And his account of Paul's journey to Rome is an exemplar of recording precise detail. And it was Luke who also penned one of the gospel records. In the four separate accounts of the life and teaching of Jesus, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we again have rich examples of geographical knowledge being demonstrated by the writers. Despite being penned by four different men, the Gospels are very much aligned in their accurate knowledge of the land, Roman Palestine, made up of Judea, Samaria, Galilee and Decapolis. Much of the action takes place near the shores of the Sea of Galilee in the north of Israel or in or around the city of Jerusalem. But there are journeys between them and to a few neighbouring districts as well. Critics suggest that local writers should know the geography well, so any errors suggest that we can't trust their accounts. Well, let's start looking at these examples. And the first one is in Mark's Gospel. Um, there are some cases that are sometimes cited as geographical errors. Um, this one, for instance, from Mark chapter 7, verse 31, where it says that uh, Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of uh, the Decapolis. Now, Tyre and Sidon are on the coast of modern day Lebanon, with Sidon some 35 kilometers to the north of Tyre. So the critics ask, why would anyone going from Tyre to Galilee take such a roundabout route? Uh, they continue, conclude that this must be because the writer didn't know the geography. However, we need to see the context of any verse and go back to verse 24. And Mark says, and from there, Jesus arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now, the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. There's a marginal note against verse 24 that some manuscripts omit Sidon. But we also must remember that not all do. It's also not a surprise to see Tyre and Sidon mentioned together because this same pairing happens in Old Testament prophecies in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel and Zechariah and also happens in the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 and the parallel account in Luke chapter 10. Notably, the parallel to uh, this story, uh, Mark chapter 7's account of this incident uh, in Matthew chapter 15, does say Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. So whilst we can't pinpoint exactly where within this region Jesus goes uh, and where this miracle is uh, performed, we can see that Mark's record that it's in the region of Tyre and Sidon is completely reasonable. The next thing we need to be aware of is just how mountainous this region is. Um, coming inland from the coast, the mountains are high enough uh, to be affected by heavy snow in the winter. The timing was probably that Jesus was here in late spring, so the, the trackways, the paths would be clear themselves. But the topography means that you would be wise to either follow the coast or the established paths through mountain passes. And one such road heads due east from Sidon, picking its way through the mountains and then reaches the uh, upper stretches of the Jordan Rift Valley. And that route then provides an easy and direct uh, route down the Jordan Rift Valley, heading to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee to Decapolis, just as Mark records in verse 31. 
So the apparent problem is resolved by understanding the context and the geography. Clearly, the gospel writer Mark knew this well. Another example sometimes cited um, in criticism of geographical accuracy comes a couple of chapters earlier in Mark, Mark chapter 5. Um, it says in verse 1, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. Again, marginal notes tell us that for Gerasenes, some manuscripts say Gadarenes. Comparing the account of Mark with the same incident in other Gospels, we see that Mark, uh, the, the equivalent in Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 says, when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, with the margin saying some manuscripts, Gerasenes, whilst Luke chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, says that they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. So all three Gospels describe uh, the same incident, uh, the healing of uh, mental illness demonstrated and reinforced both to the healed person and to the witnesses nearby by a herd of pigs, which were animals unclean in Jewish law, running down a steep slope or cliff into the lake and drowning. All three Gospels must picture this happening very near to the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Then. But on the face of it, there seems confusion, whether it's a place called Gadara or Gerasa. Worse, neither place is on the shore of the Sea of Galilee anyway. Gadara, modern day Umkais in uh, Jordan, is about 10 kilometres southeast of the lake. And Gerasa, now Jerash in, uh, in Jordan as well, that's even further southeast, about 55 kilometres away. However, understanding how the accounts would have been written before they were translated into English unlocks the problem. The place name written in Aramaic, uh, in language which could be written without vowels, is phonetically Kherasa. Secondly, if we look at the topography, the, the landform of the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, we can see quite clearly that almost all of it consists of very gentle slopes that flatten out before they reach the lakeside, where it's fringed by beaches. With the exception of one small part in the middle, directly opposite uh, from Galilee, here is the one and only part of the eastern shore where the land slopes steeply down, dropping directly down into the water. On a modern map, we can see that just one kilometre to the north of this place is the Kursi National Park. So perhaps we can suggest that the phonetic name that we mentioned a moment ago, Kursi, this is the place known today, Kursi. Again, the problem is resolved. The gospel writers are referring to a place opposite Galilee, uh, just as uh, they describe, called Hersey, with uh, the only inaccuracy arising from later transliteration of the place name. Most importantly, the gospel writers clearly knew the topography of the eastern shore uh, and described its geography accurately. Well, in the following chapter of Mark, uh, chapter six, there's the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Um, here, there's a seemingly minor detail that is included that suggests a very high level of familiarity with the geography of the area, because Mark says uh, in verse 38, uh, Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. Well, for there to be sufficient green grass to be worth mentioning, it must be springtime before the heat of summer started to turn the grass dry and brown. Although this detail is omitted from all other accounts, from Luke 9, Matthew 14 and John 6, the three parallel accounts to this, 
there's a, an important extra detail that John does mention. Um, John 6 verse 4 says, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Now, the Passover is a movable feast, uh, but it always falls within a certain date range between approximately late March and mid-April, exactly when someone familiar with the region's uh, geography uh, would know that there would be plentiful green grass uh, around. Well, before you can, we continue, um, thank you for watching so far, uh, as we've looked mostly at the earlier part of the ministry of Jesus, and shortly we're going to be looking at the latter part, um, ending in Jerusalem. A reminder that you can post comments or questions below, and please like and subscribe. Well, as I've said, not all the action described in the Gospels happens around the Sea of, the Gal of Galilee, with Jesus making at least three visits to Jerusalem during his ministry before making a final journey there prior to his crucifixion. Luke's Gospel mentions this journey of Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem. It occurs in uh, Luke chapter 17, and in verse 11 it says, on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. This verse is sometimes cited in a, as a, another example of Gospels being inaccurate with their geography, because if Jesus were to go from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south, surely he would need to head south through Samaria. Well, yes, you could go that way, but there's a problem because if we know the um, about the, the mutual animosity that there was between Jews and Samaritans, then, well, we might consider taking a different route. And Jesus, of course, was well aware of the tensions. He uses the example of the Samaritan in a famous parable to teach lessons, not just about who we should help as neighbours, but also how far the Jewish religious leaders had strayed from God's ideals. And in responding to the question that Jesus asks as to who of the people in the parable was a good neighbour, the Jewish person he is asking could not even say the name Samaritan, but only says the one that cared. Such was the mutual hatred between these two groups of people. And because of this, Jews heading south um, towards Jerusalem uh, would often have to turn east when they neared uh, Samaritan territory, heading towards the Jordan Valley from where they could then follow the road south to Jericho uh, and then up the steep climb uh, to Jerusalem, the very road that the parable uh, of the Good Samaritan uh, mentions. The explanation of what Luke says in chapter 17 is now clear. Jesus is simply avoiding going into Samaria. And far from there being any geographical error in the description, uh, the route being described is the one that you would take if you had first-hand knowledge uh, of the tensions between Jews and Samaritans. Intriguingly, I think this journey also helps us to explain another apparent conflict that there is in the accounts um, of the Gospels, uh, this time in the healing of Bartimaeus, uh, a blind man who lived in Jericho. In Mark's Gospel, um, it, the miracle occurs in uh, chapter 10 and verse 46. Uh, uh, the account starts uh, describing what happens. They came to Jericho and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. In Matthew's Gospel, uh, the miracle happens in chapter 20. There, in verse 29, it says, As they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him, and behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. By contrast, though, Luke says, as he drew near to Jericho, 
a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. Well, what's going on? Um, Mark and Matthew say it happened when Jesus was leaving, um, but Luke uh, talks about Jesus seeing a blind man um, as he arrived in Jericho. And was there one or two people uh, involved in this miracle? Well, Bible geography, understanding that uh, helps us a little bit here because the road coming down the Jordan Valley passes the old city of Jericho, but then meets the road that comes down from Jerusalem at a junction to the west of the new city of Jericho and then continues east as a single road into the city that Jesus is visiting. The ascent from Jericho, about 250 metres below sea level, all the way up to Jerusalem at 750 metres above, is no easy walk. That's a total climb of over a thousand metres, uh, so Scottish hill walkers would recognise that as being higher than the threshold for a mountain to be classed as a Munro. <laughs> And so before tackling any such climb, it would be wise to be well rested, um, to rest in Jericho overnight and then to leave in the morning when the air is cooler. We can therefore resolve the three different accounts by suggesting that Jesus came down the Jordan Valley, passing Bartimaeus on his way into Jericho to rest. Then when Jesus begins his journey from Jericho to Jerusalem the next day, he passes the same spot. Here he sees Bartimaeus again, this time with a friend, and the miracle now takes place. That the Gospels record slightly different perspectives is no surprise to anyone familiar with them. Importantly, what we see is that there's no contradiction, and the geography actually helps to make sense of uh, what we read. This leads us nicely into uh, the last geographical uh, query um, raised that we'll consider um, from Mark chapter 11. Um, Mark 11 and verse 1 says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you. Well, critics point out that travelling from Jericho up to Jerusalem, the first place reached would be Bethany. Bethphage would be second. And they argue that because the order is reversed, the account is not accurate. Well, whilst that's the case, that's not actually what Mark is saying. He says that they came near to Jerusalem and were at the Mount of Olives. And it was from here that Jesus sent disciples to a village. And Bethphage and Bethany are both on the east side of the Mount of Olives. So Jesus, having taken that steep road climbing up from Jericho, now resting on the Mount of Olives, no doubt taking in the view over to Jerusalem, um, he is now making arrangements for what is known as his uh, triumphal entry into the city. Once again, we see criticism of the gospel account dissolving when we consider the geography and what is really being described. Summing up then, well, there are many other points we could make to show that the gospels are consistent with geography. When we remember the limit limitations of geographical knowledge and the resources that were available at the time of the ministry of Jesus, then the accuracy of the Gospels is truly remarkable. We might expect someone to be able to describe their own village or local area with some accuracy, but the impressive thing is that the Gospel writers do so over an extended area, much wider than we might expect, with accurate geographical knowledge. The Gospels give us detailed pictures of the villages visited by the disciples and parts of Jerusalem, um, John especially knows Jerusalem very well, describing various places in, in the city that were destroyed in AD 70 and have only recently been uncovered. Some archaeologists studying the Bible record have made new discoveries or found that scripture enables them to explain what they've found. Geography reinforces 
what the Gospels and the rest of the Bible says. And for me, that reassurance uh, that we we get from that means that the, the text must be accurate, that we can trust the Bible. Well, thank you for watching this presentation about Bible geography in the Gospels. I hope you found it instructive and helpful. Remember to like and subscribe and share. If you have any questions about what we've thought about, you can post a comment below. Please also let us know if there's a Bible subject you would like to know more about. There's more information on our website, www.gospelonline.co.uk. Thank you for watching The Gospel Online. Wow.